speaker is from us and who is also going to tell us about not only evaluating radio velocities but also evaluating magnetic flux, which is really exciting. Uh, Florian, I'll give you a, a wave when you have five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to present the multi-mask least squassy convolution technique approach that I've been working on. So I'm going to show you how you can use least squassy convolution to extract a precise RVs from high resolution spectra. That's not a traditional application of LSD, but this is what you actually can do. And but there are some things that you have to take into account. And then there is also an extension which would allow you to ex extract the magnetic flux or a proxy thereof. And so there is a, a paper which we hope and expect to get out this month where this is all described. And also there is um, the, where the radio velocity extraction part is described. And there is also um, a code which we will make publicly available. It's all in Python, so it's very easy to use. So I'm going to um, start from the 2D shallow order spectra, and then I'm going to go through the whole process until we get to the final results, and I will show you some examples of what LSD can do. So first, pre-processing, of course. Um, then I will explain what LSD actually is, and uh, how you have to set the parameters. This is actually quite important for this technique. Um, some results, and then the extension that I've mentioned. Okay, so, um, so let's say we have a 1D spectrum from Robson, as in this case, then we can compute the stellar continuum using Michael Cardini's um, Rossin code, which is in orange now. Um, but we want to actually use this for the 2D spectra for the shell orders. Um, so we have to apply some click here. Um, so here I plot the, the 1D spectrum, which I will call S1D. That is like um, if you merge the individual shell order spectra and you stitch them together, then you get a 1D spectrum. But well, if I talk about the 2D spectra, that's what I mean, then these individual shell orders. And um, so you can, so this gradient that you see here in the flux, so this is just related to the velocity, yeah, sorry, the wavelength uh, range that the pixel measures, but you can easily um, adjust it such that it is on the same level, flux level, as the S1D spectrum. And if we do this, that means we can compute the um, we can compute the Racine continuum based on the 1D spectrum, but then we use it on the 2D spectrum. So all we have to do is we have to reinterpolate the Racine continuum for the wavelength solution of the individual orders. But because it's slowly varying, that is, that is very easy and not, not the, well, we can trust it in this case. So that means we can use Racine on the 2D HL orders, normalize them, and as a next step, we have to remove outliers. So we just remove anything above and below that blue line. And, and now uh, we have to account for telluric lines. So in the code that I, that I wrote and that will be publicly available, we use one, um, one static telluric uh, transmittance model from which you actually got from Tapas. But um, the code is ready to adjust any way of like, like any transmittance model that you want to use on your data. But this is like the easiest option that there is. Um, so what we do first is we divide by it, which removes part of the telorics, but we know that the model is not perfect. So we also have to mask some of these data points or basically flag and remove them because we know it's not perfect. Um, and how we remove them and how much we remove, that's one of these parameters that I mentioned that we have to set. Um, so let's say we've masked those, then we, uh, um, we get this map. So um, this is the pixel number and this is the spectral order from like short wavelengths to long wavelengths. And in, in red, I've color coded all the pixels that we exclude for a given spectrum. Um, it's important to always exclude the same um, wavelength regions in the reference frame of the star, not in the reference frame of the observatory. Because if we don't do that and we just include a stellar absorption line here and we don't include it there, then that can lead to, to RV um, error. So we shouldn't do that. Um, so that means that these, this map here is not the same for all spectrum. There's another thing we do, which is we uh, compare our model that we get to the spectrum 
And then we exclude pixels where um, the deviation between the model and the spectrum is, is too large, because we, don't, we know we can't model the spectrum well for these cases, so we can't either model how the spectrum evolves in time. So we can't track the RV for these data points. And I will just explain in a second what this model actually is. Um, um, so this model is based on least squares to convolution. That's a relatively old technique that's been used um, for on spectral polarimetric data. And it relies, there's a, a famous paper by Donati et al. And it, it relies on the assumption that all lines are similar in shape. So you have like one shape, and then you just scale it to the depth of the line that you look at, and then you get a model of that line. Also, the, um, it's based on the assumption that um, blended absorption lines add up linearly. Um, this is a simplified assumption, but it's fine for, uh, for example, um, a rotational broadening. So because rotational broadening can be modeled with a convolution, so that's absolutely fine. Um, then, so in total, we model a spectrum by convolving one profile with a line list. And I will just, oops, sorry, <laughs> I'll just show an example how this actually works. Um, so here we have a, a spectrum in orange in the background. And then we have the position of the wavelengths uh, of the absorption lines and their depth. So we get this from the MALT database. That's very easy. You just have to enter like um, effective temperature and so on. And then you get a list with like wavelength, depth, and some other parameters of, the, of, the, of your absorption lines in the, which you're interested in. Um, and now if you convolve this line list that I have there with the common profile in black, which I just assumed to be centered at zero now, then you get the, the model in blue. So that's the model that I mentioned before. And obviously that is, a, that is off now. And that is because the star moves relative to the observer and the wavelengths here are in the rest frame of the observer. Um, so now we have the residuals here as well. So what happens if we shift the, spec, uh, the common profile by a bit? Of course, the residuals decrease and also this model here shifts. Um, so let's do this a bit a few times. And then at some point, we're going to reach uh, a minimum of the residuals. And that's where, so that's where our model fits the data best. And then we can simply fit a Gaussian to this common profile. And then from that, we get the radial velocity of the star. Um, in practice, we don't have to do, we don't have to assume anything about the shape of the common profile in black, and we don't have to do this iterative process either. But we can simply compute it directly um, only from um, the spectrum, um, y, and the um, input that we get from the wall database, so the wavelength and depth information of the absorption lines, and uh, the uncertainties. Um, so, that. So y was the spectrum, and times that is the model that was blue, and then in pink there is the, the residuals that are below here. Okay, so then we get this um, minimization, so we minimize chi-squared, doing some linear algebra and so on, and then we get um, that z, the cone profile we had, is just this expression here. So we don't need to do any iteration or anything. Um, now, as I mentioned, there is some parameters that we have to set because LST uses this um, simplified model. So we <coughs> assume that um, all lines are, are, are similar in shape, but we know that deeper lines have a different shape as compared to weaker lines, for example. Um, some lines are saturated and so on. And also, we just model the, the stellar spectrum, but of course, we also measure the telluric lines. In, uh, we have the telluric lines in our measured spectrum. So. Uh, we have to account for that as well. Um, so we might be tempted to just apply strict um, data quality cuts, remove any data point that is affected by a telluric deeper than 1% or something, and remove all the data where our model doesn't perfectly fit the data. Um, but then we actually remove a lot of RV information, because even if we don't fit the spectrum perfectly, we can still get some RV information out. Um, so that means. Um, how do we now set these parameters to optimally extract the RV? Um, there are these four parameters that we have to set. Um, so one is the outlier removal. So if you, if you look at this, like let's say one of these data points was like 
um, let's say we didn't have this line here, then we would have a high residual here, and we would want to exclude this. Um, so that's what I mean by, by outlier removal. Um, then there is a maximum depth, depth of included absorption lines. We know that these have a different shape, so we might want to exclude them as well. But they carry RB information, so in some cases we want to include them. Or, um, and the third thing is the, the width of the cone profile. So as I said, it's a convolution of, um, of the cone profile with this line list. So the wider the common profile is, the more of these um, basically overlap at the given point. So that can lead to, to problems. Um, so we have to um, basically set the width of this common profile as well. And as a fourth point, we want to also um, define when we exclude a data point. Do we exclude it if there is a caloric line deeper than with like transmission deeper than 10 percent or 20 or 1? So that's not an, an easy decision to make. So, so we need a strategy to set these four parameters. And um, so there are different options that we tested. One was to, to just find, try to find the best combination from the spectral type or the um, signal to noise of the spectra, or the air mass, and so on. Um, but this was turned out to be very difficult, and we didn't find um, the best solution using that. Then we try testing just this set of spectra. So if we have 100 spectra, we take maybe 20. Then we apply different parameters, and we just check for which parameter combination we get the lowest scatter. And then we apply that parameter combination on all spectra. Um, but it turns out that this is not feasible because the optimal um, parameter combination is different for each subset of spectra. So we might just take 20 spectra get the best parameter combination where we exclude all telorics because it's heavily affected by telorics. But then for 20 other spectra, we should actually not exclude the data because it carries valuable information. Um, so, that's, so it's not a good idea to just set one um, combination of parameters and just use this throughout the, the, um, the time series. Um, there's also this third option, test all time series and find the best parameter combination. But as I just explained, that's not a good option. But we went with the first one, like test all parameter combinations, or just a reasonable amount of uh, parameter combinations. Um, so here I'll show you one result. There's, there's the RB here, and then I've just, um, so this is just uh, the index of the spectrum. Um, so that, that's not fine. And uh, so you see the CCF, DRS, RBs in blue, and then you see the, the LSC RBs for one, selection of these four parameters. For example, we could have excluded uh, telluric lines deeper than 10%, and we exclude all data where the difference between the model and the spectrum is more than 0.1, and so on. Um, then we choose the same parameters, but now we exclude, for example, all uh, data affected by telluric deeper than 20%, and so on. So we try different combinations. In total, actually, 32. So we get 32 different RV time series. Um, now we can closer analyze these time series. And one thing we can do is we can, so for each data point, for each spectrum, we have the CCF RV, and we have 32 different RVs from these 32 different parameter combinations. So we can compute first the mean of these, and we can also just um, discard, for example, half of the um, RV time series that lead to the highest scatter. Because we know that some of these parameter combinations might not be ideal, so we want to probably remove them. But we don't want to rely on the RMS too much, because we know that the RMS is not an ideal measure, and that the planets also like lead to a higher RB, RMS. Um, so that reduces this reliance on that. That's also another reason why we don't want to choose just the, the RB times series with the lowest scatter. Um, so I'm showing you some results here. Um, so that's the histogram of the RMS that we get for um, six stars. So the histogram is for the 32 different parameter combinations that we chose. Um, then there's also the DRS CCF RB RMS and this um, pink solution here. So the mean of the 16 times series is the lowest RMS. So I've plotted that one because that's the one that we're going to go for. And for, for these six stars, we could also choose just the mean of the 32 time series, that's fine as well. 
but the pink one is what you're going to go with because it's safest and for some stars there might be some parameter combinations that are not ideal, so it's, it, it's safer to do that. Um, one thing that we can see is that choosing this mean of over this, param uh, over this RB time series leads to an RMS that is in most cases lower than the best single um, parameter combination. Um, also here, there's actually some outlier that influences, <laughs> otherwise it would also be lower. And um, we can also see that the, the RMS is lower than for the TRS-CCF technique. Um, I could also show you the, the median absolute deviation that's also lower, that's actually lower for all of them. And um, we also accounted for trends, so we, if there was like a big gap between two chunks of data, then we uh, removed this and computed the RMS, and that's also lower. Um, so here's one outtake of this uh, time series that we get. Oh, yes, five. Okay. Um, five. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that we can deduce from this is that for some data points, we might have um, a low or a relatively low error, error bar, but we have um, high scatter for these 32 different parameter combinations, and each one of those would be reasonable. But if we don't compute it, we don't know what the dependence is on the parameters that we chose. But if we have these 32, we can actually see for which, which data points are more uh, susceptible to change due to the parameters that we set. Okay, so some results. This is the sum. This is in the very centric frame. And if we, so for, for this, to compute this, we assume the heliocentric correction to be unknown. So let's remove the, um, the solar system planets. Then we get this. So we have a lower scatter, you can see this here, but overall as well. So lower <laughs> scatter for the MLC technique. Um, then I want to show you Kepler 21 as well. There's a paper by Lopez Morales that is this more like explained their analysis. And again, we get a lower scatter for MMLSD. And if we compute the periodogram, we see that the signal is that, so the signal is here where this, um, pick, where this uh, violet line is. And the signal is very much stronger in the periodogram of the MMLSD RVs <laughs> as compared to the DRS RVs. Also, you can see here that there's this forest of lines, which was um, attributed to cellular activity in this paper, but we don't have it in MMLSD. Um, now, next steps is to compute the um, hemispherically averaged magnetic flux as described in. So this, this figure is from Able 2020, but there's also a description in Able 2016. And the reason for this is that it correlates with the um, RV variations. This has been mentioned by um, Sam Halverson yesterday as well. So how do we compute it? Let's say we have no magnetic field, and we have one transition here. If the magnetic field is non-zero, the um, the degeneracy of this energy level is lifted, and the energy then depends on the um, magnetic quantum number m. So that means in one, instead of one transition, we have three. That means because the energy is different, we have three different um, absorption lines which overlap. So instead of one absorption line in black, we have this broadened absorption line in, in red. So we want to measure this one. I should also say this broadening. So this is proportional to the wave on the squared. Um, the line specific Londe factor, which you get from above, and the magnetic flux. It is also dependent on actually the, um, the geometry of the magnetic field. Because um, if, you, if, the magnetic, if this vector is parallel to the line of sight, you just see the shifted components. If it is perpendicular, you see all three components. So it depends on these two factors the geometry of the magnetic field and the strength. Um, so, how do we do this? This is a spectrum, and this is our classical approach with the vault data, and we just convolve it with the profile. And what do we do now? Instead of this, we have uh, the three absorption lines, and they're all shifted according to that Zeeman shift that we calculate. And then we just convolve this as before, and uh, find it, we find the best fitting um, convolution model as a function of B, and that gives it B. Um, here again. So conclusions. We have a Python pipeline that uses LSD to get high precision RVs. The uh, RVs have a lower scatter as compared to the US, uh, as compared to the CCF technique. Hmm. It's very flexible. You can choose the lines that you want to include or exclude. You also get a common profile and a convolution model, so you can also compare your your spectrum with the model and see how these um, deviations evolve in time. 
and we do not remove planetary signals, and there is a possible extension for them in the clocks. And this is going to be available soon. Great. We'll start with Baptiste, and let's go Baptiste. Um, great talk. Um, I was wondering if you try to use a different uh, when you select your mass, is valid. Yes. Are you taking into account the long factor, and can you build a mask which will be more optimized uh, for the detection of B? Yeah. So we could, for example, exclude those with a low long factor and so on. We played around with this. We don't have any like set conclusions yet. Okay. Well, what do we have? So, so I don't want to button for the CCFT. <laughs> but just one thing, uh, I'm, just, I'm not sure if your conclusion is really correct. What I understood is you were rejecting quite some part of the spectrum that we were not matching. Uh, because just with the CCF, like we just have this template where there is all the numbers except the ones that are like And then we just take everything. Uh, and we don't like cherry pick uh, which uh, lines are well. Like if there is too much jitter and yeah, so on. Right. So if you if you do the same exercise with the CCF, you're like more or less to the I think to the same uh, I would say. Uh, then of course here you have the magnetic field, so this is the cool part about it. So I mean so we, we tested this on other stars as well. So this was like developed on some stars, but recently I've tested it on two other stars. And we we get the same results, we get the lower scatter. But do you recalculate the CCR with, with rejecting the lines that you don't take, what or the region of the spectrum that you don't take in your, um, in your and then we calculate? We, we have not done that, but also like because it's a different approach, I think some regions can be, are useful for LSD and are not useful for the CCF techniques, like the ones where it's blended due to the rotation. Um, well, we, we could do this comparison, but, but we haven't done Okay. I, I, I agree a lot of it is in your selection of the parameters and your mask, not necessarily in the mask behind CCF or LSE. That's your point, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just basically. So it's just the liners? It's just the, yeah. And the parameter selection, and a little bit of it is the model, I guess, which allows us to extend easier. Um, for, for all the GP people in here, technically, you can add a GP in your error matrix. I, I have played around with that, but technically, that the S error matrix doesn't have to be a diagonal one, which it is now. But technically, if you want to apply a GP in there, you can. Mm. Any other questions? We have a question uh, from Nuno Santos uh, on the slide. Uh, did I understand right that you use the same profile for all the lines? Uh, I wonder what is the impact of the fact that different lines at different wavelengths will be differently affected by stellar noise. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not noise. Stellar <laughs> 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 activity affects. <laughs> so, so, so we use so each order has its own spectral and has its own common profile. So, so that that's one thing. So we don't compute the common profile for the whole spectrum, but just for the um, for the orders, and then we com combine the uh, of the different orders. We have checked what happens if we exclude the deepest lines or and so on. But we you do you do lose RV information if you exclude those. Yeah. Okay. In some cases, not in all. So there's not yeah. yeah. So on the on Sabia's point, I suppose on, on like if it's if it's line list or things like that. You tried all these different projects, like you said 32 different ones, essentially different types of lines. Do you have a do you learn some things there about which lines are valid? This brings me back to yesterday when someone showed that using one order gives almost as much information as using all the orders. How, how you know, are you kind of finding that you don't need many lines? You just you know, you, if you use a fraction of the lines, you get the same answer. Um, no, if you use a fraction of the lines, we get a higher scatter. And um, what also what we saw also is that if, it depends on the star. So if you have a very like quiet star, then we want to maybe be more rigorous in in the rejection of, of bad data. If you, have a, if you have a lot of bad data, we want to be less strict in the exclusion of telluric lines, for example. But we use the same so we use the same line list first, but then we exclude some. But only the regions that we know might be. Um, affected by by some effects that lead to RV error. Like so, 
Do I understand it correctly that you're saying that if you have a new star, if your flight is to any random star, you're saying try a bunch of different approaches or different line lists every time and see which one works best? No, that's not what we do because that would rely too much on we, because we don't know which one is best. Right, exactly. Yeah. So we use the same line list. We exclude data that could be bad but could also contain some valuable information, and then we check which one it is. So we try to find this balance between excluding data and including it. Um, so we're not saying that we should just randomly choose pick um, lines or exclude lines, but it depends on which of those are badly modeled, which of those are affected by the moves and so on. But that depends on your target, which you don't know ahead of time. Yes, but if you do if you do this like different uh, combinations, you should find a balance in every case. While if you just use one parameter combination, you will not. I see heads up. So you said that when you're building your LSD profile, you take the, the depths from the valve database. Um, so I guess that depends on your macro turbulence, like this fudge factor that, that you just assume and hope that it's good enough. I'm, I'm guessing it doesn't matter that much because you use CPUs very well. But um, what do you think the impact would be if that um, sort of convective broadening term was a bit wrong? And how accurate do you need to be there? I think even if the depth, let's say the depth is a bit off, even if it is off, I think we're still going to trace at least the evolution, like the shift quite well, because the best fitting one is still in the middle of this line in this case. Um, but it would be very interesting to see um, what this, this would look like if we had the perfect depth estimate, because then also the errors would fit better. So what we... Hmm? Ah. So that, that would be like on the to-do list to also because they use an LTE approximation and there's an LTE list, so that would be very interesting to see. I'm going to use my chance privilege to ask a question, uh, which was, so when you were discussing the possible extension to measuring magnetic flux, you, uh, you showed an illustration, a schematic illustration, where the, the zip splitting was larger for the shallower line. And I wondered if including that in your measurement, in addition to trying to measure the flux, would also give you systematically different RVs because convective shift affects weak lines yeah. predominantly. Yeah. So we think that it might improve the RVs if we account for this properly and this and the splitting and so on. Um, is that does that answer? Yeah, it might improve the precision, or at least it might give you different RV. I mean, I think I don't think any star has a single RV at any time. But, um, but yeah, I think it might give you some like, uh, qualitatively different RV that will continue. Especially when they're a little blended due to um, rotational broadening. Okay, might make a difference, yes. We have time for one question from the Slack, and then yeah. one question in the room. So we have, <clears throat> we have a question from Eric on the Slack. Um, what threshold or thresholds um, for telluric rejection did well in your optimization? Yeah. Um, so usually, so I think the CCF techniques use like one percent or so. So we started usually to ten percent. That was a like that was kind of the minimum that we, okay. we found. So ten, twenty percent, five percent around that region. Okay. Uh, so. If I understood well, you're basically correcting some of the fluids, and then you're removing some parts where the correction is not as good. Um, so we corrected partly, and we also, ex I think that's because we partly corrected, we can also exclude more, less generously. Yeah, but, but then you're, you're excluding some regions that, from my place, it, it looks like you're excluding regions that were near the continuum level. So how do you select those little parts where the correction was not as good? How would you select the background? So, you, so after correcting, you are removing some parts where the correction was not as good, right? Yes. How are you defining those regions? Oh, so because we, we don't have to select any. Ah, uh -huh, okay, we get them from the top of spectrum, like right. the trans transmitting spectrum. So there we just check which absorption lines are deeper than 10%. Oh, okay. Um, or because we have to select one, because of course the depth varies. And we always want to exclude the same lines because of the problem that I mentioned. So we have to fix that to one. Because what I think I think the question arose because on the plot you showed, it didn't look like necessarily the excluded 
parts of the spectrum were where the telluric lines were deepest. But I think the plot you should include is both stellar and telluric lines, so maybe that's yes. where the... Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think, thanks again for a very interesting